at that time. And our main goal is to establish or to predict PPPK modeling strategy to predict DDI on intestinal PGP through these works. Okay. Then this is quite basic, so I don't think this is necessary for today's audience. So I, I'll quickly go through it. So first, like in, when intestinal PGP is inhibited by inhibitor, then substrate FA increases. And when PGP is induced, then substrate FA decreases. Okay, any question? Okay. Okay. And this is just for visual purpose. I even don't know like this relationship for relationship shows like sigmoidal curve or not. Just like you know, when those increases and then PGP is getting saturated, then substrate FA increases. Then like PGP inhibitors and induce are working oppositely. Then when uh, PGP is saturated like this area, then we expect minimum DDI with PGP inhibitor. I think uh, it's okay. <laughs> Any question? Okay. So, uh, so I think like we have quite a few clinical DDI data set showing this scenario where we don't need to incorporate PGP-KI to CYP3A PGP dual inhibitor, such as ketoconazole and doraconazole. And this scenario may also be applicable to PGP inducer if PGP is totally saturated. So this means like, you know, DDI on PGP are dose dependent because DDI really depends on substrate FA or PGP kinetics at clinical doses. So this also means like we need to, we really need to focus on not only PGP perpetrator, but also PGP substrate to understand PGP mediated DDI. Okay. And this is just example for those dependent DDI. So this is a postinib anti-cancer drug, and this is a dual substrate of CYP3A and PGP. Uh, clinically, clinically recommended dose is relatively high, 500 milligram once daily. Then clinical PK data show supraproportional increase in oral exposure, particularly at lower doses. This is likely due to PGP saturation. Then we have three clinical DDI studies. You no, know, bostinib 100 and 500 milligram with ketoconazole and bostinib 500 milligram with rifampin. Predicted FA is like 0 0.3 at 100 milligram and 0 0.7 at 500 milligram. Then if you focus on ketoconazole DDI study results, CMAX ratio and AUC ratio appears to be dose dependent. So then uh, CMAX ratio is more pronounced. So I'll focus on CMAX ratio today because this is more reflected by intestinal PGP mediated DDI. So observed CMAX ratio is 5 at 100 milligram and 3 at 500 milligram. Then when we accounted for ship 3 inhibition only, then we significantly under predicted DDI at 100 milligram and slightly under predicted 500 milligram data like this one. So we incorporated PGP inhibition in addition to CYP3A. Then we reasonably predicted the DDI at both the doses. For rifampin DDI, again, if we accounted for only CYP3A induction, then we under predicted DDI. Then if we incorporate PGP induction, then we reasonably predicted DDI. They are with rifampin. But unfortunately, we don't have if I'm in DDI with positive 100 milligram, it must be interesting to see the result, whether you know DDI is uh, dose dependent or not. But this result suggests, especially ketoconazole DDI results suggest, intestinal PGP mediated DDI are dose dependent at a certain dose range. Okay. Now I like to talk about PBPK modeling for PGP mediated DDI, including inhibition and induced induction. For substrate, we need like in vitro PGP kinetic parameters such as KM and JMAX. Then uh, in our modeling approach, we estimated IBIB scaling factor for PGP JMAX, assuming unbound PGP KM to be intrinsic. And for inhibitor, we need in vitro PGP inhibition parameters such as KI. Then we estimated IBIB scaling factor for PGP-KI to recover clinical DDI results. 
for inducer, this is a little bit, from, little bit different from inhibitor because we didn't use in vitro PGP induction parameter such as Indomax in the C50 because we use like SIMSHIP version 17 and 18. These are like functions available at SIMSHIP version 20 or higher. So we estimated model predicted fold increase in PGP activity based on substrate JMAX scaling factor. So I'll talk about this method later you know, in detail. So first, I'd like to talk about substrate modeling. Then again, like uh, as I mentioned before, we need, we need in vitro PGP kinetic parameter of PGP substrate. So we f selected the four PGP substrate, digoxin, talinorol, quinidine, and abigatan etexylate. We ran KECO2 assay to estimate these parameters using compartment kinetic models. Then, assuming unbound came to be intrinsic as a general hypothesis, we evaluated IBIB scaling factor for PGPJ max to recover clinical PK data. Okay. Then, uh, sorry for very busy slide, I will not go through detail. Just like uh, we have a PBPK model for Digoxin, talinorol, quinidine, and dabigatan etexylate. And this is a prodrug. So we, all, we also need active molecule dabigatan and PVPK model. Then I just like to emphasize, like we use if you got one for all PGP substrate, then we enter like in vitro PGP KM and JMAX to like these PVPK models. Okay. Then these are like uh, PVPK model for PGP substrate IB data. So again, quinidine, talinorol, quinidine, sorry, digoxin, talinorol, quinidine, and this is just Davigatara, not like Prodrug, Davigatara IB profile. Then you can see we reasonably predicted IB profile. Then uh, for PK parameter estimation, estimation, like uh, we provisionally use like you know prediction error of plus minus 25 percent as one of the predefined criteria for model performance assessment. So if we focus on prediction error, we got a large value for prediction error for CMAX, but as you can also see, like, you know, reported CMAX value also shows large variability. For this modeling, at least for AUC, we reasonably predicted, like, a AUC with prediction error of, like, less than 25%, with one exception, which is, like, 26%, which is not bad. So we applied our PBPK model to oral PK profile. Then first we predicted like, you know, plasma concentration time profile using JMAX scaling, scaling factor of one. So this means like we eventually don't use a scaling factor, just we assume in vitro PGP JMAX is equal to in vivo PGP JMAX. Then as you can see, actually we reasonably predicted plasma concentration profile for this PGP substrate. But for dabigatran etexylate, we significantly over-predicted plasma concentration like this one. So we ran parameter optimization and sensitivity analysis for PGP JMAX scaling factor. Then result shows scaling factor of 2 to 5, reasonably predicted like plasma concentration of jigoxin, talinorol, and quinidine. But for dabigatran etexylate, we need a you know, large scaling factor of 55 to uh, recover clinical PK data. So reason is not clear, but I will get back to this point later, okay? Then these are PK parameter. Again, following parameter optimization, PGP JMAX scaling factor, like 2 to like 2, 4, 5, and 55, we reasonably predicted CMAX and AUC with prediction error of less than 25% for all cases. So these modeling results su suggest we reasonably describe the like, P oral PK result of this PGP substrate. So we use like this PGP scaling factor for DDI prediction. Okay. So now I like to talk about the inducer. So as I mentioned before, we didn't use a PGP induction parameter like Indomax and INDUC50. So what we did is like this one. So eventually in control group, we already estimated scaling factor. I already showed you, right? Then um, in test group with rifampin, we actually multiply scaling factor by fold induction. Fold induction means rifampin mediated fold induction in PGP activity or abundance. So this is just an example. If scaling, scaling factor of four in control group, 
Then if we assume false induction of three in test group, then we multiply four by three to get 12. Then we use like 12 as rough ref value in test group. So I hope this is clear. If not, I'll be happy to uh, follow up. Then these are like sensitivity analysis results for refamping mediated PGP induction for these PGP substrates. So x-axis is PGP fold induction from 1 to 10 in log scale, and y-axis is prediction error. So this dot, dot line represents plus minus 25%. And that is like C-max ratio, and blue is like AUC ratio. So as you can see, if we assume 3 to 4 holds or increase in PGP activity. Actually, we reasonably predicted, you know, C-max ratio and AUC ratio for all these PGP substrates. Like uh, all right cases, like uh, blue line and red line are within 25%. With a little bit, this is a little bit off, but overall, 3 to 4 holds increase in PGP activity reasonably predicted. Uh, DDI result or between these PGP substrate and UFAMP. Okay. And these are plasma concent I mean model predicted plasma concentration and observed uh, result. So assuming like PGP fold induction of three either three or four fold depending on PGP substrate, we reasonably predicted decrease in plasma concentration in test group with refamping, this red line, right? And these like model predicted three to four fold increase in PGP activity actually very consistent with literature reporting three point five fold increase in PGP abundance measured by Western blot. So our model predict uh, our predicted you know fold induction actually very consistent with observed biopsy data. Okay. So these are PK parameter estimation. So eventually like if you focus on prediction error. Then when we assume a prediction of uh, PGP induction of 3 to 4 volt, we reasonably predicted like Cmax AUC and Cmax ratio AUC ratio in test group with a prediction error of less than 25% like this one, all cases. So this means also this maybe suggests like present PBPK modeling approach can be applicable to other PGP substrate and possibly PGP ships dual substrate because we got consistent fold increase in, by defamping among these four PGP substrate. So now I'd like to talk about second paper. This is a collaboration with Xi'an, Sibyl, and Mian in SimShip and Banketish in AstraZeneca. So our main objective was to evaluate impact of concurrent PGP and the ship rate induction on DDI between defamping and 12 PGP substrate, including dual substrate using PBPK modeling. And in this paper, we just assume 3.5 fold increase in PGP activity. So we didn't run any sensitivity analysis for scaling factor, just we fix like 3.5 fold increase. Then these are like a list of 12 PGP substrate. Then I also put like FM ship 3A. So eventually nine are like ship 3A PGP dual substrate. And we also have three PGP proof substrate. Then basically we use in vitro PGP KM and JMAX value like this one. But for three compounds, we didn't have any PGP in vitro PGP KM and JMAX, so we just use PGP intrinsic clearance values. So as you can see, we cover wide range of intrinsic clearance from two to five hundred like this one. Okay. Then uh, these are prediction results. This is a little bit complicated. First, like this is a Cmax ratio and AUC ratio, and this line is unity with two-fold errors. Then first, we predicted uh, DDI by accounting for only ship three induction. So these are like you know upper symbol or like origin of like these like vertical arrow line. Then uh, we also did like P DDI prediction by accounting for both ship three and PGP induction. These are like a kind of lower lower symbols like this one. So if we focus on, let's say, like example, Davigatana etexylase, this is not really PGP sub, sub, sorry, ship three substrate. So if we account for only ship three induction, then we predicted no DDI. Eventually, AUC ratio, Cmax ratio is one, right? But if we accounted for PGP induction, then we predicted Cmax and AUC ratio, like on the board, 
on the line of unity line like this one and these are like PGP proof substrate so you can see our modeling uh, result shows like accounting for 3.5 fold PGP induction in addition to SIP3 induction improved prediction accuracy for both CMAX, CMAX and AUC ratio for most most substrate data so this may suggest this also may the present PBPK modeling approach can help in the prospective DGA assessment of new chemical entity that the PGP or PGP ship ray dual substrate. Okay. Now I like to talk about model limitation. First one is time dependent PGP induction. Eventually we didn't take account for time dependent PGP induction. However, clinical DGA results were reported at the steady state of revamping exposure. So this may suggest PGP induction could also reach steady state. So we think uh, our modeling approach will consider like, you know, steady state prediction. But now if we can simulate time dependent PGP induction using like simulation version 20 or higher. Okay? And second point is PGP induction in other organs such as liver and kidney. Because we are uh, focused on only intestinal PGP induction by refamping. And then if you focus on these graphs, like these are like steady state refamping unbound exposure in systemic and portal vein. So blue lines like a steady state unbound plasma concentration. Then I also put that red dot line here. This is represent PGP in the C50 of 250 nanomolar from SIMSHIP version 20. I also put like uh, orange dot line as a reference. This is like a ship 3 in the C50, actually very comparable. Then as you can see, unbound like uh, steady state exposure or revamping actually higher than PGP in the C50 up to maybe eight to 10 hours. So in principle, revamping could possibly induce PGP expression in several other organs such as liver and kidney. However, hepatic and renal PGP induction appears to have limited the impact of systemic exposure of PGP substrate, as this paper suggested. Actually, this paper indicated clinical relevance of hepatic and renal PGP induction is not clear right now. Right now okay? And third point is Dabigatalan etexylate PVPK model, as I mentioned before. So as you know, like Dabigatalan etexylate is product and PGP substrate. An active molecule, the bigatalan is not PGP substrate. And the bigatalan is formed from like the bigatalan etexylase through these two intermediates. And this like a biotransformation bio definitely takes place in intestine, especially this pathway. But uh, in our modeling approach, we just like uh, assume the bigatalan is directly from the bigatalan etexylase. So we ignore these two intermediates because of lack of information to develop like these intermediates. So this may be possible reason, one of the possible reasons why we got such a so such a high uh, PGP scaling factor to recover clinical DGA, clinical PK data. Okay. So now I'd like to talk about the inhibitor. Okay. First I'd like to show like this FDA document, FDA review document for Eldafitin. This document indicated, you know, our in-house data, eventually FDA data suggested in vitro KI value generally underpredicted, observed in vivo DTI between PGP perpetrator and Jigokishin. And because there is uncertainty in translating in vitro KI to in vivo KI toward PGP, PBVK model prediction was considered qualitative but not quantitative. This was a little bit shocking to me because we always keep saying like PBPK modeling is quantitative, right? So when we started like, you know, PBPK modeling for PGP inhibition, we thought we would need IBIB scaling factor for PGPKI, okay? So we selected like, uh, uh, like itraconazole and verapamil as PGP inhibitor. We also included their primary metabolite, hydroxy itraconazole and norverapamil. As you know, all of them are like PGP ship dual inhibitors. We also selected like PGP substrate, jigoxin, dabigatalan etexylate, quinidine, based on available clinical DDI result. Okay. Then we went to University of Washington database to collect IC50 for like this inhibitor. Ideally, uh, we like to have each inhibitor KI against each substrate. 
but the data sets are quite limited in University of Washington database. But uh, also like, you know, IC50 shows large variability or wide range of IC50 with like you know, different substrate in different assay systems. So we decided to focus on DDI data set of digoxin uh, and substrate in KCO2 assay. Then we calculate median IC50. Then assuming like KI is half of IC50, we uh, get like a KI value for one micromolar for itraconazole and two micromolar for berapamil. We also found like itraconazole KI against the bicatana etexylate in KCO2 assay. In this case, KI is 0.22 micromolar. So this is five-fold lower than KI against digoxin. So we use like these two KI input parameters to predict itraconazole dabigatalan DDI. Eventually, we compare like this DDI prediction between these two input parameters. We also found berapamil KI against quinidine in KCO2 assay, just N equal to 1. KI is like uh, 2 micromolar, which is very comparable to KI against Digoxin. So we still use KI of 2 micromolar for all berapamil DDI prediction. And in contrast to parent drug, metabolite data set is quite limited. But at least we found like hydroxy toraconazole KI against digoxin. This is like 0.8 micromolar, but not from KCO2 assay. And this uh, KI is quite comparable to parent drug. And norberapamil KI, we found 0.15 micromolar which is quite potent compared to parent drug 2 micromolar. So we use this KI value for DDI prediction. But as you can see, data set is not really robust. So we decided to run in-house study to determine uh, in vitro KI value of each like inhibitors. So as studies right now ongoing. Okay? Then we also need itraconazole PBPK models. So as uh, do you know, like, you know, Peter had a great presentation in 2020. He compared, like, itraconazole PBPK models, actually three PBPK models, like SMC library file, and AstraZeneca file, and IQ file. And he concluded, like, here, all models performed comparably when evaluated multiple dose PK exposure, even though there are some difference in input parameter, such as FU plasma, FU gut, and KI values. But as you can see, all models don't have like uh, PGPKI values. So these models are completely for ship 3 DDI prediction. Okay. But uh, Peter also reminded me here, like, you know, uh, inefficient PGP will be added to future version of the file. So as he presented, now we have a PGPKI value in version 21. As you can see, these values are really potent. So based on this information, we decided to use IQ model because this paper also indicated other model, which is really required for our prediction. Then we entered like a PGPKI value from University of Washington database. Then for Berapamil PPPK model, Shari Sibir et al. published like this paper in 2013. So they are uh, developed and verified Berapamil and Noruberapamil PPPK models. And I believe Simus library file compound, these are based on this paper. So these are input parameter. So we decided to use like this Simus library compound file, but we also up optimize some input parameter to recover single and multiple dose PK and DDI result with midazolam and rifampin. We also use like PGPKM and JMAX value from recent paper, 2019 paper. Then we entered PGPKI in values from University of Washington database. Okay. Then these are like key input parameter of PGP inhibitor. Just like uh, I will not go through the detail, just I like to say like you know, these like reported uh, model all all the model use like FU got one for parent and metabolite. And this is a really key parameter site of action concentration for modeling. So I like to discuss type of action concentration for these models, okay? And then I believe many of you are familiar with this table. This is like, a user, like being used like a simship workshop. So this indicated concentration on transporter binding site for like, you know, PPPK modeling. So then we focus on GAT with efflux transporter like this one. For parent 
parent drug, Adam model is on. So site of action concentration, the Adam predicted unbound enterocyte concentration. If you got times uh, predicted enterocyte concentration in each intestinal segment. So when we have if you got the one, we are using a total enterocyte concentration for DDI prediction. Then for metabolite, unfortunately, Adam is not available for primary metabolite of inhibitor. So we have to go Adam off. So this means we are using like you know a site of action concentration model predicted unbound portal vein concentration. If you got times predicted portal vein concentration. So this means when we have if you got the one, we are using total portal vein concentration for DDI prediction. So this is not in line with like, you know, free drug hypothesis we generally assume. So we've decided to use metabolite PGPKI only in liver, assuming negligible intestinal PGP inhibition by metabolite. So this is a big assumption in our modeling approach. So I'll get back to this point later as model limitation. Okay. Then these are like input parameter. Sorry for busy slide. So I will not go through the detail. Just you know, we use if you got one for all models. And then we use like PGPKI value in DIVA and GAT for like parent drug like here and here. But we use only KI value in DIVA for metabolite. Okay. This is our approach. Okay. Then these are like uh, model predicted and clinically observed plasma concentration PGP substrate in the itroconazole DDI study. So this is digoxin, and this is a dabigatalan eticsylate with PGP KI of one micromolar against digoxin in vitro. And this is a KI of 0.22 micromolar against dabigatalan eticsylate. And these are quinidine data with two different dosing regimens. So as you can see, uh, we reasonably predicted digoxin and quinidine plasma concentration. And in this case, this paper doesn't uh, indicate any PK profile. So I just put Cmax at Tmax. At least we reasonably predicted Cmax. And for the Vigatana attack rate, when we use PGBK1 micromolar, then we kind of under predicted plasma concentration in test group. But when we use PGPKI 0.22 micromolar, then we reasonably predicted plasma concentration type profiles. Then these are PK parameters. So I like to focus on Dabigatara eticsylate first. So again, when we use PGPKI 1 micromolar against digoxin, we tend to over -pre uh, sorry, under predicted CMAX AUC on the CMAX AUC ratio like this one. But prediction error still within 50%, which it may not be bad. But if we use PGPKI 0.22 micromolar, then you can see prediction is improved, especially AUC ratio. So we also did sensitivity analysis for KI. Then uh, result showed KI 0.3 micromolar reasonably predicted DDI, you know, within like prediction error of less than plus minus 16%. So this data may suggest that like, it would be important to determine in vitro PGPKI to add substrate used in clinical study, although data semit data set is quite limited, eventually n equal one. Then if we focus on digoxin and quinidine prediction, including Davigatana text rate, eventually we reasonably predicted DDI with prediction error of less than 25%, with a few exceptions, but still up to 30%. So overall, we, these modeling results suggest PBPK modeling reasonably predicted itoraconazole DTI with PGP substrate. And as you noticed, like, uh, we didn't use P, uh, IBIB scaling factor for KI. Eventually, in vitro KI reasonably predicted uh, clinical DTI result for itoraconazole. Okay? Then these are model predicted and observed plasma concentration of PGP substrate in the DDF st study with Berapani. Okay, this is a digoxin, and these are the Vigatalan eticsylate with three different like dosing regimen, and these are quinidine with two different dosing regimen. So as you can see, we reasonably predicted uh, plasma concentration of this PGP substrate in the DDI study. Then these are PK parameters. So as you can see, like uh, if you focus on prediction error, all prediction error, I mean prediction error for all PK parameter within 25%, with one exception, this is still 26%. 
So overall, our modeling approach reasonably predicted better permeable DDI result with PGP substrate. And again, in this case, we didn't need like in vitro, in vitro IBIB scaling factor for PGP KI. Eventually, in vitro KI reasonably predicted DDI. Okay. So now I'd like to talk about model limitation. First one is PGP inhibition in other organs, such as kidney. So there is a possibility PGP inhibitor could inhibit PGP in other organs, such as kidney, because we focus on only liver and gut, mainly gut. And these are steady state uh, unbound exposure of itraconazole and metabolite, verapamil and metabolite. So you can see that, and then I also put PGP KI values like right here. So you can see unbound systemic exposure, steady state exposure, at least five-fold lower than PGP-KI value. So eventually unbound systemic exposure did not hit PGP-KI values we use. So this may suggest systemic effect of PGP inhibitor on PGP-mediated DDI can be expected to be minimum unless significant accumulation of unbound drug takes place in certain organs. Okay. The second point is metabolite-mediated PGP inhibition in DEI, as I already told. Eventually, we assumed metabolite-mediated PGP inhibition was negligible in testing. For this modeling approach, we thought of some uh, kind of rational, like this one. So first one is predicted FG4 itraconazole and verapamil are greater than 0.8. So this suggests minimum metabolite formation in enterocytes. And as far as we know, no paper reported. Drugs administered intravenously could inhibit absorption of PGP substrate. So it's really not clear how metabolite distributed from portal vein to repeat by layer in epical membrane of enterocyte where PGP is located. And this is more like, like a reference. Okay. These are all like uh, metabolite concentration, steady state concentration, okay? hydroxy toraconazole concentration, and norberapamil concentration. Then when we assume FU GUT of 1, we are using like total portal vein concentration for DDI prediction. So in this case, like total portal vein concentration metabolite, in this case, are five, four-fold higher than PGP-KI values. For norberapamil case, like two-fold higher than PGP KI values. So if we assume if you got the one, then uh, site of action, site of action concentration definitely hit PGP KI values. But if we assume like a free drug hypothesis, eventually if you got this equal to FU plasma, then unbound portal vein, vein concentration 20-fold lower than lower for hydroxy toraconazole and five-fold lower for like norubelapam. So if we assume free drug hypothesis, then uh, site of action concentration didn't hit PGP-KI values. So today, uh, predicted result I presented today are actually very comparable to the result when we assume FU gut is equal to FU plasma, eventually if we use free drug hypothesis. Okay. Then now I'd like to talk about the relationship among PGP substrate FA, substrate scaling factor, and PGP inhibitor KI. So we performed sensitivity analysis for scaling factor and KI value to investigate the impact of this parameter on PGP substrate FA in DDI study of itraconazole and verapamil. Okay. So as I mentioned before, substrate FA is quite sensitive to both substrate scaling factor and inhibitor KI. So we like to understand the relationship among these uh, parameters. We also did some sensitivity analysis for inducer, but this is more like preliminary uh, assessment. Okay? So these are like model predicted relationship among substrate FA, uh, substrate scaling factor, JMAX PGP scaling factor, and uh, itraconazole PGP KI or inhibitor KI. So these are itraconazole DDI and these are verapamil DDI. So as you can see, we got a quite comparable like relationship uh, in all cases. So let's say this is just an example. So if PGP KI value is quite potent and substrate scaling factor is really lower, then PGP is completely inhibited. So we can get FA of near one. Or if PGP-KI inhibitor is not really potent, then scaling factor is high. Then we've got like FA is really low. And between this point, we've got kind of some 
steep slope area or curve like this one, right? So this uh, indicates the uh, substrate FA, predicted substrate FA largely depends on both substrate PGP scaling factor and its uh, inhibitor KI values, okay? Then uh, these like symbol represent our prediction point. So as you can see, our prediction are still in kind of like, you know, uh, some uh, steep slope areas. So this means like model verification, both the substrate and inhibitor would be key for PPPK modeling to predict DDI on PGP inhibition in, in testing, okay? And I already showed this slide you know, for like sensitivity analysis for refampin mediate PGP induction. Eventually, three to four fold increase in PGP activity reasonably recover refampin mediate DDI for this PGP substrate, right? Then, as I mentioned before, like uh, eventually we uh, multiply scaling for substrate scaling factor by fold induction in test group. So it means substrate scaling factor is quite important. In the case of Jigokshin, scaling factor we use a two. So three to four fold increase in PGP activity means scaling factor of six to eight. So you can see like fold induction really depends on predict substrate JMAX scaling factor. So these modeling results also suggest like model verification PGP substrate would be key for PPPK modeling to predict refampin mediated DDI. Okay. And this is really appendix. I was curious about like Indumax and the Industry 50 because it's available in version 20. So we did like a DDI prediction between Jikokshin and Defampin using like Defampin default file in version 20. So we reasonably uh, recovered clinical DDI results. And prediction error is like less than 25%. So then um, we did sensitivity analysis for Indumax and Industry 50. So you can see substrate FA really sensitive to Indumax up to maybe 8 to 10, then relatively flat because FA is already near zero, right? Then uh, substrate FA also sensitive to Industry 50, but this appears to be like less sensitive to Indumax. But overall, uh, substrate FA also like sensitive to both Indumax and Industry 50. A big question may be like how we can, how to accurately measure or de estimate Indumax and Industry 50 in vitro, right? So FDA, DDA, FDA DDI guidance, as you may know, did, did this guidance indicate some drug can induce PGP. So however, there is no validated in vitro system to study PGP induction. Therefore, determining a drug potential to induce PGP should be based on clinical studies such as chip induction study. So probably we need to wait for advance in science for more in drugs industry 50 prediction. Okay. Anyway, this is a summary. Our proposed PPPK modeling approach for intestinal PGP mediated DDI prediction. Again, we really need to focus on both substrate and perpetrator. For substrate, we need like, you know, in vitro PGP kinetic parameter such as KM and JMAX. Then many paper actually recommended we should use compartment analysis. Then once we got this data, then we can estimate IVIB scaling factor for JMAX to uh, recover clinical data. For PGP perpetrator, we also need in vitro parameter such as in vitro KI. Our modeling approach indicated we can use in vitro KI values for DDI prediction. Then if we focus on refamping uh, DDI, then we can use 3.5 fold PGP induction to uh, predict DDI. Then we also like uh, focus on unbound concentration at the site of action as we always do for like, you know, transporter mediated DDI. Then once we got this, I mean model, then we can apply this model to predict intestinal mediated DDI. Then we believe like present modeling approach can be applicable to predict PGP mediate DDA with other PGP substrate and perpetrator. Okay. So I'd like to thank you know Pfizer Transporter Group like Chester, Sarah, Soraya, Amy and Amy and Barma and Dave. Uh, I really enjoy working with them when I was at Pfizer. I also like to thank like my current colleague Raymond, Rocky, and my boss Tatiana. And also I'd like to thank 
Bangladesh in AstraZeneca and Xi'an, Mian, Sibir in SimSip for our uh, collaboration, which I also really enjoyed. I also like to thank like Sibir again and Masoud and other SimSip scientists for their tremendous support, especially whenever I have any question. So this is just one example. Uh, in like 2018 paper, actually I got a very challenging comment from reviewer. So I sent the email to Masoud and he gave me lots of helpful insight. And also he, at that time, he also forwarded my email to Sri Ram and Matt, and they, they also gave me lots of helpful insight. So I really appreciate SimSip scientific you know, support. And uh, lastly, but not least, I'd like to thank everybody online. Thanks for calling in. So this letter means like thank you in Japanese. We say arigato. Okay. So that's all. I'd be happy to take any questions. Arigato. <laughs> Arigato. <laughs> yeah. So um, thanks. Uh, thanks for that talk. That was brilliant. Um, there's a few questions that have come up um, online. Um, Pradeep, did you want to unmute yourself? It, it's relating to near the beginning when you were talking about the um, uh, the substrates um, and determining the um, Vmax and KM. Yeah. So eventually, yeah, we uh, we uh, estimated KM and JMAS for four PGP substrate in the same same like assay method in like one lab, Pfizer lab, and then we got this. We use these values. Then uh, question is like why we need like different scaling factor. Is this correct? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, yes, my question is if yeah. your uh, test system, the in vitro system was same yeah. for the substrate, Yeah. Uh, what is the rationale that you need a different scaling? From yeah. yeah, this is a really good point. And uh, I believe that like, uh, no, in vivo JMAX scaling factor may depend on each, sub, each substrate because like absorption site may be different. Maybe it also depends on those because like a uh, PGP expression uh, is different in each site or in intestinal site. So it's not really like uh, homogeneous, right? In, in intestinal is not really homogeneous. So where, where your compound is absorbed, it's maybe important to uh, estimate PGP JMAX scaling factor. This is what I'm thinking, why we need such different scaling factor. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And uh, the second question was um, from Devon. Um, it was about applying the different PBPK, uh, sorry, PGP JMAX scaling factors uh, for a particular dose, and did the scaling factor work at different doses administered? So, yeah. so any dose sensitivity, I guess. Yeah, this is also a good point. So. First, like uh, for drug, uh, I already mentioned, like uh, scaling factor may depend on each drug because of absorption site or the PGP expression level in the, each site. And then if we use like a different uh, doses, some compound we still cannot recover clinical data with same JMAX scaling factor. Kind of like lower doses, we need some high scaling factor. So this may be depend on still absorption site. But some compound we can use like same scaling factor for to recover different dosing data, different dose data. So it looks like it depends on some compound right now. Then I don't have a good answer for why we have a different kind of like you know scaling factor between those for some compound. Maybe like the absorption site is different. Maybe solubility makes different different like absorption site or different absorption mechanism. Yeah, right now I'm thinking so. Yeah. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks, Inji. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions online? Um, hi, um, it's Melissa. Can I have a um, quick question for the um, the induction? Sorry if I met um, missed it, but. Did you put the induction of PGP 
I mean, the gut or the gut and the liver, and if it's the case, um, how do you, what is your thought of what kind of induction we would expect in the liver? So, sorry, could you please say it again? So, I yes, saw some course. noise. Sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no, it's okay. Um, so, for the induction for yeah. rifampicin, yeah. um, did you, um, I'm unsure if you added the induction only in the gut or gut and liver. And for the liver, do you have any thought of what kind of induction we should expect? Because for what I've understood, the induction for in the gut are more or less based on on data that that are basically measure of um, change of expression in PGP in the gut that the ratio will be uh, behind that and uh, as far as I'm aware we don't have this kind of data in the liver um, yeah yeah this is also a good point so eventually we focused on intestinal PGP induction by defamping so we mm -hmm. only focus on intestine so we Ignore like PGP induction in DIBA. Yeah. Yeah, I, just, I was just wondering, I suppose, yeah. same challenge that it's lucky that we have something, but uh, we don't have any data to yeah. put a value easily. So, yeah. just if you had any thought on that. Yeah, more like um, based on like literature search, I already present model limitation. Uh, like these uh, review paper indicate like uh, clinical relevance of hepatic and also renal PGP. Sorry, uh, I, this is a like PGP inhibition. PGP induction, I still don't see any like, you know, cl clinical evidence showing mm -hmm. PGP induction in liver. Yeah, maybe it's very difficult to uh, measure, let's say, biliary excretion and so on. So yeah. I don't see any paper. Mm -hmm. So we didn't incorporate PGP yeah, induction in Yeah. Thank you. Is there any other questions? Um, so uh, Shinji uh, has agreed to um, the recording of this uh, webinar, so it should be uh, available at a later date um, on the Scientific um, Series YouTube channel. So um, thank you for that. Um, thank you also again for your your talk. It was a really good one, and uh, yeah, it, it gave us a lot of information and gave a uh, real insight to the amount of work you've done in this field and um, yeah highly appreciated and yeah very Thank much you. an expert in this <laughs> and leading the science in that that area for uh, PGP um, so thanks for that so hopefully you, you can uh, see that one right. um, so there is um, a webinar which is happening uh, next week, uh, which is uh, managed um, through the Satara website. So if you wanted to sign up for that, um, you can do so on the, on the website there. And this is um, a talk with um, Karen, obviously from SimSip and Dr. Sun. Um, and they're gonna be talking about uh, the strategic application of PBPK modeling for predicting drug-drug interactions and the effects of smoking and organ impairment. Um, so essentially it's looking at olanzapine and also a combination um, with the opioid receptor antagonists. So um, this is a, public, um, a presentation that will be happening next, next uh, Wednesday um, 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 4 p.m. in the UK or 5 p.m. in Europe. And in terms of the next scientific webinar, um, links in some ways because um, Sibylla was heavily involved in uh, some of the work that uh, Jens has presented today, but this is a slightly different area looking at um, food consistent 
uh, drug interactions. Um, so this is presented by Dr. Neuhoff and uh, Emily, um, both from uh, Satara. And this will be on Wednesday, the 9th of February um, at 11 a.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. in the UK and 5 p.m. Uh, in Europe. So here we can uh, see what the topics can be covered, looking at bergamotin, a grapefruit juice component as a perpetrator. And um, this is a work that was um, a collaboration with AstraZeneca. Um, so um, thanks again, everyone, for uh, joining today. I hope you um, enjoyed the presentations and um, please join us for the next webinars. Thank you and uh, goodbye. Thank you.